Episode 27 of the Bloodstream podcast is made possible, as always, by our sponsor, Shire, who also sponsored the Wheels for the World Memorial Bike Ride honoring Barry Hardy this past weekend that Natalie and I participated in. You're going to hear more about that in just a moment. Before we jumped into the heart of the episode, I want to give you a couple other quick updates from all things Bloodstream Media and Believe Limited. It may be August, but we are busy, and uh, as all of us are looking ahead to the fall, uh, so are we. So here's what we have going on to tell you about. Uh, breaking through our new program, bringing together 25 teens affected by bleeding disorders for a music theater arts workshop uh, in New York City this fall. Applications are now open uh, to submit to this incredible new program. If you haven't heard us talk about it before or uh, seen anything about it online, I advise you to go to breakingthroughhemophilia.com. There's a three-minute explainer video and then applications and nomination options. Uh, for 25 young people, this is going to be an incredible experience this fall, uh, coming together to put together an original musical about life with bleeding disorders from the perspective of our high school teens. Gonna work with professionals from Broadway, um, uh, as well as with their fellow community members to co-create this original piece while also learning how the arts and theater can provide therapeutic and healing tools useful for your life outside the rehearsal studio. So breaking through hemophilia.com, applications due in by no, uh, November, September 1st. November's when the event happens. We need to plan. September 1st, get those applications in. Or if you know a young person with a creative streak or maybe somebody who just needs a new opportunity to find a different kind of community and try something new, uh, we prioritize experience, We prioritize willingness to participate above hard skill sets. So please check out breakingthroughhemophilia.com and help us spread the word. This is going to be a great program and I want to make sure we give as many people as possible who could be interested an opportunity to apply. We've gotten some great feedback on the most recent episode of the Ask the Expert podcast featuring Debbie De La Riva. Uh, talking about mental illness, um, depression, and suicide prevention. Uh, that was with host Chris Bombardier, but I actually jumped back into the Ask the Expert world for that one. So it was a three-way conversation between us. Great, great episode, very honest, um, just truly sharing. Chris and I sharing our experiences of of living with our forms of mental illness and, and Debbie sharing what she knows as an expert trained in the field. The latest episode of the Powering Through podcast features our conversation uh, at the Idaho chapter uh, with Preston Bowling, Ali Cashel, and Skylar Openshaw. Shaw, that's available at poweringthrough.org. Thank you to NCHS for making that possible. Season eight of Stop the Bleeding is wrapped. Um, that's just something I'm learning to live with. It's always a bittersweet moment when the season is done. Uh, if you haven't checked out any of it, um, stbhemo.com. You'll find it on YouTube. Search Stop the Bleeding, uh, Stop the Bleeding Hemophilia. It's been an incredible ride. I can't I can't wait to just hear more feedback from people on this season. Um, we have a couple of plans to, to share these episodes with uh, various uh, festivals and, and other at-large uh, outlets that we, you know, we try to sneak Stop the Bleeding into the, the, the mainstream of online content consumption because of its, its very nature of being kind of just a funny show. There's an appeal outside our community, and that, that usually is something we focus on after the episodes have gotten out we've, and we've gotten them out to the community. So excited to see who else we can reach with, uh, with Season 8. And STB and Espanol, our Spanish language version of Season 8, will be coming out later this year. We'll be announcing that here, of course. Um, if you haven't done this before, uh, it really does truly help. If you listen to other podcasts, you hear people talk about it all the time, please leave Bloodstream a rating on iTunes. If you haven't subscribed to us on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or wherever you're listening, that would be extraordinarily helpful, and we would appreciate that. Share Bloodstream episodes on Facebook and Twitter. Tell a friend about what, what what's going on here in the podcast world. Um, we, uh, we, we have found that word of mouth tends to be the most effective way of growing our audience. So if you... Uh, if you hear things that you think could benefit somebody in your life, do tell them to check out the episode. We greatly appreciate that. And of course, you can stay in touch with us, send us suggestions, ideas, or if you'd like to contribute to a future episode as a share contributor, ways to get in touch with us, facebook.com backslash bloodstream media at bloodstream media, uh, excuse me, at bloodstream info. I should be used to that by now. At bloodstream info on Twitter or email us mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com. All right, now's the episode. And welcome to the Bloodstream Podcast, episode 27, August 20th, 2018. I'm Patrick James Lynch. And I'm Natalie Lynch. On this episode, CBD oil is being used more and more to treat pain, anxiety, stress, and much more. So what should you know before considering CBD oil? 
Natalie presents a piece addressing that very question in today's Like segment. Sherry Lucky offers her Living in the Shadows with Mild Hemophilia story in today's Share segment, and I'll address the court ruling and the ongoing patent dispute between Shire and Roche Genentech in today's Comment segment. Plus, we hear from participants and organizers from Save One Life's Wheels for the World Barry Hardy Memorial Bike Ride that took place in Rye, New Hampshire this late August in today's interview segment. All that and more coming up on this episode. Welcome to Bloodstream. So I guess one quick program note, we're recording this today in uh, Brooklyn, New York, just before the Wheels of the World bike ride tomorrow in New Hampshire. Um, and our neighbors today, it's music day, I think, for all of our neighbors here in Brooklyn. I've never heard them play music except for when we were setting up to record this podcast. You know what? Maybe it's people who are going back to school next week and they're like, this is it. We got to like party psyched. it up. <laughs> yeah, it's a Friday. It's a weekend. Maybe I, I guess they have a half day. So um, just forgive any unnecessary background noise. There's a little additional echo this week as well uh, or this month or this episode, but we're fine. We're all adults. We'll make do just fine. It also uh, seems like they keep playing the same song over and over. Like, <laughs> loop. I don't know what's going on. Also, when I went out to get coffees or drinks just a little while ago, there were like five people who found a dog that had just been running around. And then like a 13 year old came out with her little sister in a leash to like put their 65 pound dog like back on a leash and bring it home. <laughs> so there's just some like wacky stuff going on in, in our hood right now. Um, Natalie, before we jump into the community news and kick off um, kind of the meat of the, the podcast, we have a, a fun update to provide our listeners. Last month, uh, we had Rebecca Haber as our interview guest. Um, and she was extraordinarily pregnant at the time and had found out through her pregnancy that she had a uh, hemophilia C, that she was a carrier for it, that her to be born son might have it. She, well, there's an update, Natalie. And what is that update? So I heard from Rebecca this week, uh, baby Wren, which is the name, by the way, beautiful name. W R E N. Yes. Could also be a radio station. <laughs> Um, was born on July 29th. Uh, she went into labor on the 28th, early morning, and uh, he arrived about 24 hours later on the 29th. Um, he was six pounds, 14 ounces, 20 inches long, and is not uh, does not have hemophilia C. His factor 11 levels were normal, and uh, he came out healthy. Rebecca had zero bleeding episodes, though she did take the plasma. Which is, you know, for those who listened last month, that was kind of the, one of the big considerations was whether that information then presented the possibility for her to take plasma preventatively or to at least make sure it was on hand. Um, and we talked a bit about the struggle she was having in uh, making sure that that was being prepared for adequately. And uh, something that we learned before the baby was born, but after the podcast was recorded, uh, she had been talking to her OBGYN, but then they ended up contacting um, the hospital mm -hmm. and found out that uh, there there wasn't necessarily the, the giant waiting period that the OBGYN had uh, prepared them for. A little or yeah, um, yeah. So that the decision could be a little bit more spontaneous. Right. Uh, she did tell me in her email that um, there was a bit of a wait time and while she was having contractions, that wait time felt long. Right. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but um, yeah, so uh, no bleeding episodes, no bleeding episodes in the postpartum period. And she's been a mom now for about, well, I've, uh, almost a month when this podcast is yeah, released. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, for, for a little over a week now. Um, and yeah, they seem to be doing great. <laughs> so congratulations to Rebecca. What was her husband's name again? Brian. Brian. So Rebecca, Brian, Brian, and, and Ren. Ren. <laughs> congratulations, guys. And uh, again, thanks for sharing your story and a bit of your journey with us. That was a lot of fun to kind of be a part of that. Um, and thank you for that update, Natalie. So let's go ahead. Let's move into our community news in 60 seconds. Every month there is a collection of community news that comes out. We can't get to all of it here with depth and on the Bloodstream podcast, but Natalie and I do pride ourselves on our ability to race through some of it in a segment we like to call Community News in 60 Seconds. And this is how it works. We will read the community news. It'll take 60 seconds. We'll get through as much as we can, get what you get from it, and then check the program notes afterwards for more information and links to these various stories. Natalie... This is usually about the time in the podcast you get extraordinarily anxious. A little vomity. How are you feeling? A little vomity. Okay. Community <laughs> news in 60 seconds starts 
now. NHF's Handy organizes a bundle of resources for students headed off to college. Check out the link in the program notes for more. A new patient financial assistance program has become available for individuals with hemophilia. The Assistance Fund, AF, is a charitable foundation that was created to provide eligible patients with chronic diseases, help with co-pays, co-insurances, deductibles, insurance premiums, and incidental medical expenses. Link to uh, Assistance Fund website in the program notes. Shire's discontinuing the b- 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 <laughs> Come on. <laughs> the company's Factor 9 human plasma-derived prothrombin complex concentrate product. That was not easy. Okay, here's a long one. Spark Therapeutics. Their stock fell 30% following mixed results from their phase 1-2 study of their gene therapy candidate SPK8011. Most notable was that a 7-patient high-dose cohort saw 5 patients achieve factor 8 levels between 16 to 49%. Okay, but the other 2 patients developed an immune response, uh-oh, that caused factor levels to drop below 5%, uh-uh, with one landing in the hospital in an incident that meets the criteria of a serious adverse event. Uh, Sparks phase 3 study intends to move forward with this deepened understanding of dosing at this higher level. Health Canada approves hemolibra for hemophilia of 8, eight patients with inhibitors. Okay. Cedric Hermans, a uh, medical member of the World Federation of Hemophilia's Board of Directors, has been named editor-in-chief of the Hemophilia Journal. He takes over for Michael Backer. We've done worse. Yeah. I mean, you had a giant paragraph that you did really well with, and then I had like seven words to say, and I uh, stumbled over it, almost every single one of them. That's true. Yeah. But also in part because it was, <laughs> you, were, you weren't set up for success when you have to, there's no pacing uh, when it's paragraph, sentence, paragraph. But yeah, we did try to like get some stuff in there that was maybe a little more uh, meaty. Um, so it took up a little more, a little more airtime. Um, I do want to just, uh, right at the end there was mentioning that Cedric Hermans from the, the WFH board has been named editor in chief of the Hemophilia Journal, one of the preeminent journals in our community. Takes over from Michael Macris, who is uh, an extremely active um, hematologist, professor, and uh, Twitter user. And I actually noticed just before we started recording, you know, whenever we're looking at community news and in general, when we're thinking about what do we want to prioritize, not just here in Bloodstream, but at Believe Limited in general, with so many companies and so many products being developed and at different phases of pipeline development with various levels of understanding about how these new sciences uh, and these breakthrough sciences actually work, with the availability of information that previously would have been behind closed doors until trials had been completed, but now it's kind of out there, so we have to contend with it. Um, it is a different world when it comes to how how we think about products that are available now, products that are being developed, and what's, what's meaningful, what updates are meaningful which, versus what are just part of the process because it does seem like every day there and we've talked about this before there's just more and more and more and more um so about an hour before we started recording this tweet from michael macris we live in a changing world all companies conducting gene therapy trials and hemophilia are announcing updates and give data and press releases to the stock exchange rather than presenting them at scientific meetings it is difficult to keep up with where each of them is at so that is um one of the leading experts and most active uh, hematologists in our community globally expressing, I'll use the word frustration, or at, at the very least, um, expressing that it is difficult now to keep up with the science and what's truly meaningful versus what is intended to move a stock price. So interesting, interesting, yeah. interesting. And, um, you know, we're doing our best to try to present what we think is meaningful, but also it's important that you all who are listening, um, you use your judgment follow up on the stories that interest you, be curious, do your reading, ask questions, and don't necessarily just take everything that you read at face value without any deeper thinking. I guess that's kind of the bottom line in the end. All right. Anything to add to that? Well, I was just going to say that if uh, the current editor in chief of a leading journal in our community is saying it's difficult to keep up where they all are at, then uh, no one listening to this should feel bad if they're, they feel like they're having trouble keeping up. That is very true. Former, former editor of the journal now, um, as Cedric Hermans has taken over. All right, that's it. Community News in 60 Seconds. If you liked anything in there, you want more information about it, find the links in the program notes. Now for our episode 27. This is episode 27, right? You know, we're a few minutes into it, so I've forgotten already. Episode 27. Uh, comment. Nope, not there yet. What are we on? The like, the like section, segment. my that section. Segment. Segment. Oh, this is just oh a disaster gosh. right off the bat. All right, well. This is our, 
our everyday fight segment You're versus second. Literally every day of our life, <laughs> Natalie and I fight about this very important topic. Okay, so speaking of very important topics, CBD oil, as we know, is being, um, you're hearing about it more and more in, in, in mainstream outlets as a form of pain management, as a, a, a tool that can be used to cope with anxiety, stress, trauma, so on and so forth, as something that can be used for certain disorders. Um, were you just sharing that in June, there was a medication, FDA approved medication that includes CBD oil? It's the first medication with a cannabis compound to be federally recognized. So we are in the future, y'all. Uh, we're moving we're closer and closer to this being something that we're actually allowed to partake in completely openly. And I was just actually talking to a, a community member um, who's a little bit older than I am about this individual's father. And this person got their father to finally try CBD oil for um, uh, pain, and, but they for a long time were just so resistant to it because of their associations with uh, weed and illegal and it's, and people are, you know, we were talking last night about my aunt, people just live in such pain and then what they, ha uh, anyways, I don't mean to get on my soapbox <laughs> right off the top, sorry. No, so I mean, a lot of these CBD oil products have giant hemp leaves on them. And I think uh, fear around marijuana and drugs uh, actually cause these people to not try products that could be of great service to them. Mm -hmm. But CBD oil is gaining traction and popularity. And this article goes through about the things you should consider um, if you're considering to buy CBD oil online. Yeah, so take us through, like what does the article kind of like lay out and then what, what are the top things that we should be thinking about? So this article's in Bon Appetit, which- uh, Like all good <laughs> CBD articles ought to be. Which is amazing. Um, so, but it's showing how how, Which is amazing. It is amazing. That it's in it's Bon Appetit? Yeah, it's showing. Why? Well, first of all, I mean, I don't, like off the top of my head, I thought that, I think it's a cooking magazine. I would think so. <laughs> so um, just like interesting that <laughs> this- Probably should have done that research <laughs> before we decided to center a story around something from them. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've looked through this magazine before. Right, recipes, restaurants. Yeah, yeah so that's- their, It's a lifestyle, but they have cooking, a health- and that seems to and be where the health- And this section is called healthish. Oh, very, very 2018. Very 2018. Um, but it's a really easy uh, digestible article uh, with embedded links to further like scientific abstracts and articles and journals. You were saying you can um, really go down the rabbit hole of information. If you want to, yeah. Um, but what it does is it breaks down like what is CBD oil? What is CBD? So CBD is a cannabinoid and just like THC, which is the psychoactive property in marijuana, um, these plants contain hundreds, hundred uh, cannabinoids and CBD is one of them. Mm -hmm. And it does have medical properties. So uh, the article kind of breaks down, it explains what these things are and then- What these things are? what uh, these cannabinoids are like, okay. and how, you know, it, it is a THC is the psychoactive one, but CBD oil is, is not right. Um, so I learned a lot today too, just if you want to go down the rabbit hole, learning about the plants and how they split off, like it's kind of, kind of a cool thing. But um, if you're just interested in relieving your pain. Right. And like most people are probably just looking <laughs> for like, what, what do I need to know? I'm in pain. This is scary to me. So what questions should I be asking in order to start to lean into CBD? So there's, there are two types of CBD. One is uh, from industrialized hemp and one is from cannabis. Okay. The differences are the industrialized hemp CBD contains 0.3% THC. That's pretty insignificant. Pretty insignificant. So insignificant that it's labeled as containing zero. Right. It's kind of like the alcohol content in kombucha, right? It's That's like it's a, a, irrelative. Yeah. You know, you can, you can Irrelevant, be rather. Uh, 16 and buy a kombucha. Right. Um, Ex that's a great example. Thank you. So, but the cannabis one has uh, significant levels of THC. Right. And if you're in a state where it is recreationally or medically recognized. Which is more than half the states. Um, you can go into a dispensary and get C uh, cannabis CBD. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a benefit to cannabis CD CBD because uh, THC actually provi provides what's called the entourage effect. Mm. And it actually helps. Um, I mean, I don't, I'm not going to be a uh, scientist right now and try and, and uh, tell you about yeah, the mechanisms yeah, but, of it, but it, I think it helps um, accelerate and uh, There's some increase. kind of good synergistic interaction. Uh -huh. um, the, hmm. the benefits. I didn't know that. So if you have access to cannabis CBD, it's actually um, 
you know, the. But there will be that 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 um, psychedelic effect. Actually, no. Hmm. So in uh, the amounts that are in it in the cannabis one, do not actually create a psychoactive effect in so your brain. So it's not that 0.3 amount, but it's still a relatively small amount. It's not going to have that brain effect. Correct. Uh-huh. Um, but if you are, uh, you know, I think trying to avoid maybe a drug test or things like that. It is THC. Going it's going to be in your the system. the industrialized hemp version is probably uh, the much safer option. Right, right, right. Good but point. But yeah, so that there's that. And if you're in a state that recognizes it, you're buying from a dispensary and it's state regulated. So there are regulations, there are tests that things go through, potencies are... Um, like all that information is available mm -hmm. because it's been tested. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're buying online, you're buying industrialized hemp. And this article was kind of specifically trying to help people looking online too, right? Like there was kind of a specific angle for an online buyer. Correct. Okay. Um, and then I think that's people who in these popularized interests are are buying online. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're getting curious. So uh, the article goes through a couple of questions that um, you should consider when you're buying um, industrialized hemp CBD or most anything that's sold online. Um, knowing where their CBD is from when they're going to buy it is very important um, because if the CD, CBD is not from the US, it's definitely not legal. And hmm. um, if they can't tell you where the farms are, they may not know. So knowing, you know, you know, if you don't know where the farms are from, they may be from out of the country. No, you or, made that point earlier about it being an ag agricultural product ultimately. So you should be able to trace things like the farm that it's on and how it's cared for and managed and maintained the same way that you would, you know, bananas that you buy. You exactly. should theoretically be able to get that information with relative ease. And then uh, the article for, uh, goes on to further say, because it's an agricultural product, knowing if it's local or organic is also important. But the USDA has been slow to label hemp farms as organic. So uh, when you're shocking, <laughs> when you're going to track this down um, to find out if a product's actually organic, you're going to have to look at the lab results. Um, so you know this is sounds a little fussy. It it is a little fussy, but I but this is also I think important for us. Uh, anything we're consuming as humans. Uh, at this point, trusting labels and things aren't, I, I think you should do your homework. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the next question to ask is, is this full spectrum? So what is full spectrum? Full spectrum is the use of the whole hemp plant versus isolates, which can be extracted, uh, the CBD from, isolates that extract the CBD from the plant. Got it, okay. Um, and you know, using marketing terms like pure and natural isolates are sometimes not hemp at all, and they're synthesized in a lab. So that's important to know. And not that hmm. isolates are bad, because uh, that's actually what's used in the medication that was approved in June by the FDA uh, for epilepsy. Okay. So it's not it's not that it's a bad thing. Um, so what's the difference? Like, what's significant about the difference between full spectrum versus the I isolates? They're called isolates. Well, it's. Uh, an isolate which extracts, extracts the, the CBD, CBD from the plant as opposed to the whole plant. Um, is there benefit to the whole plant or or what's the, like, what, what is the significant difference? Why, why does this matter? Um, well, in addition to potential benefits, there's another reason you should be buying a whole plant is um, contamination. So as soon as you go to extract something mm -hmm. from the plant mm -hmm. and not taking the whole plant, there's another process and that can lead to contamination. Gotcha. So yeah, so just, so it's just a, a more adding pure, steps, got it. Um, process. Um, and, you know, there was a, in, in Utah, actually, uh, there was an issue. People became sick from uh, an isolate uh, with synthetic CBD. I feel like Utah is one of the worst states where things could have gone wrong at this stage right. for people trying to incorporate CBD. And but, you know, nice try, Utah. Keep, the article keep going. puts it this way. Would you rather get your vitamin C from Sunny D or freshly squeezed orange juice? Well, I'm supposed to say freshly squeezed orange juice, <laughs> But you right? like Sunny D. No, I like freshly squeezed orange juice. <laughs> um, and then also, does the label list the amount of CBD per serving? And why this is important is, um, a, because it contain it could contain little or no CBD, which is uh, important. 
uh, you're wasting your money well, at that point. How do you also like know that? How do you know how much CBD you should be taking? Is it based on like body weight or like how do you figure that stuff? Well, so there is a bell curve with CBD, and if you take too little, you're n- you're not going to receive the benefits, and if you take too much, you also are not going to receive the benefits. Mm-hmm. So it really is. Um, they're calling it the the Goldilocks effect. You really need to find the the just right amount. Um, and with any of this, oh, like, I get it. The just right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you said Goldilocks earlier when we were preparing and I was like, okay, okay. now <laughs> yeah. I get it. Okay. It's cute, right? It's, well, <laughs> it's cute. Cute CBD. Um, but yeah, but with any of this too, uh, talking with your doctor is important. You know, we're the bloodstream podcast is not, uh, yeah, we're not trying to give you medical, but we're just or, trying to help give yeah, resources to you. Yeah, if you're planning to, to you. buy online, these are the things you should, should think about. You should look at this article if you're planning to buy online or you're intrigued because it is it is a great article and it does give you the availability, like you said a couple times, to go down these rabbit holes of information. There's lots of hyperlinks to other articles, additional information, latest legislation, et cetera. Yeah, and uh, also there's links to CBD brands uh, that have well-sourced farms that openly share their tests. like. And then you can click on them too. So they've kind of done the homework for you. Right. Um, that you can click at these links and then the tests from the farms are on these links, uh, which which is great. So you're not just like yeah, yeah, <laughs> searching yeah. all over the place. But it's, it's a great article. It will be included in the program notes. And if you're considering CBD, uh, consider these questions. Boom. All yeah. right. Thanks, Natalie. Of course. We'll be right back with the share segment. Before we get to this month's share segment from Sherry Lucky, quick moment to recognize uh, Shire for making the Bloodstream podcast possible as always. But also, uh, since we are now on the other side of Stop the Bleeding for 2018, at least the um, the 10 episode season, we still have to release STB in Espanol later this year. That's being worked on right now. But Shire has been the supporter of that since the beginning. Um, we are now 49 episodes into Stop the Bleeding and um, uh, just another incredible season that I'm very grateful to have been able to create. I hope you all have enjoyed. I hope you've seen some of the episodes. If you haven't, if you haven't, hit pause. Go to stbhemo.com. Click play on one of the videos. There's 49. Just click play on one of them. Watch for 16 seconds and see what you think. And then if you want to keep watching, keep watching. But um, I am extraordinarily proud, especially of what we did this season. Um, Took some bold chances, changed things yet again, as we continually try to top ourselves to make make the resource more valuable, more entertaining, more interesting, more educational, uh, and just frankly, stronger. So thank you to the entire team who helped make it possible, many of whom uh, are or will be listening to this at some point. Thank you to Shire for their continued support of Stop the Bleeding. And of course, for their support of the Bloodstream podcast, as always, we like to say, Thank you, Shire. All right, now to Sherry Lucky, who has um, uh, written and recorded this uh, powerful piece called Living in the Shadows with Mild Hemophilia. It packs quite a punch. So uh, sit back, take a listen, and Natalie and I will be back on the other side. Here we go. living in the shadows with mild hemophilia. I turned 50 this year. As I reflect on how hemophilia has been a very large focus of my life, I am struck by the fact that my focus has always been on the males in my life with severe hemophilia, whom I love. However, I myself have also struggled with bleeding. But as a woman with a bleeding disorder, we were often in the shadows of the men around us. My older brother, Jimmy, was born with severe hemophilia before factory placement therapy existed. When I was a baby, he was in the hospital a lot. As we grew up, factory became available, and I have clear memories of being awakened in the middle of the night to meet the doctor at the back door of his office so he could give my brother his medication to stop his bleeding. It was terrible watching Jimmy suffer through the pain of bleeds and the multiple needle sticks that he would receive. Growing up, the focus was naturally on him a lot, and I did my part to keep him company and to care for him when he was sick. He was my hero, suffering bravely. 
In 1987, when he was diagnosed with HIV, it was a massive blow to our family and others whose loved ones were also being diagnosed. Jimmy fought valiantly, but lost his battle in 1993 at the age of 28. That left me alone to be there for my grieving parents and to figure out how to be a parent myself to my son, who was born with hemophilia just 10 months after Jimmy died. My son Jay later developed inhibitors after an intracranial hemorrhage at the age of 11 months. Having a child with hemophilia B and inhibitors is hard. There's no way to sugarcoat it. I went from watching my brother suffer to watching my precious baby boy suffer. My son is now a man of almost 24 and I continue to watch him struggle. But throughout this journey of being supportive of my brother and my son, I have had many bleeding issues of my own that often went untreated, and I suffered in silence. At the ages of 6 and 12, I had teeth removed for a straight smile. After each of these oral surgeries, I bled for at least a month. Dealing with the nausea, bad breath, blood loss, and discomfort was hard, but doctors continued to tell us that girls do not bleed. When I was 15, I had a major jaw surgery to correct my severe overbite. My jaw was wired shut for eight weeks, and during that time, my incisions continued to spurt blood into my mouth every time I laid down on my side and put any pressure on my cheeks. Finally, my brother Jimmy demanded that the oral surgeons test my factor nine level as I was getting ready to have my wisdom teeth out. I was sent for the blood work, and the doctors stated that the results came back completely normal. I had my wisdom teeth out and again continued to bleed. I was awake night after night sitting in a chair so I wouldn't gag on the large clots that would form down my throat. This time Jimmy took me back to the oral surgeon and asked to see the test results. They had tested my factor 8 level, which was of course normal. Jimmy again demanded the factor 9 test and my level came back at 10%. After that, I was considered a symptomatic carrier. After giving birth to my first child in 1994, I attempted to advocate for my bleeding disorder, but I wasn't taken seriously. I ended up having a massive hemorrhage that went undiagnosed for six days because the male OB decided I was making things up and refused to see me. When my husband called and explained that I was passing out in the shower and passing clots the size of grapefruit, he told my husband over the phone that I was suffering from postpartum depression and not eating enough. Finally, I began to lose feeling in my legs and I insisted that the doctor see me. When I walked in, they immediately began taking me seriously. With a hemoglobin of four, I ended up having emergency surgery and four units of blood. Thankfully, things are beginning to change as more doctors recognize that women do indeed bleed and we have very unique and specific issues. I am so happy that my twin girls can be seen at a women and girls clinic to handle their bleeding issues. I have also found a great team that takes me seriously and makes sure that I get treatment when needed. I am hopeful that research for women with bleeding disorders will continue to advance so that we no longer have to live in the shadows. Wow, all right. Well, thank you, Sherry, for sharing that piece. Uh, A lot of components to Sherry's story there. Uh, Natalie, anything in particular jumped to mind for you or a top of mind takeaway from that uh, story? I mean, definitely uh, just women in health. Yeah. I, uh, as a women's advocate myself, um, I'm always uh, enraged when I hear a story that... uh, likens a woman's concern of her health to hysteria Mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. um, when she's having grapefruit sized clots that it's postpartum depression. Like there's such a cognitive dissonance in that. Like it's, it's really, it's, it's very frustrating. And, and women every day in this country are dying from not being taken seriously when they have serious concerns about their health. So, um, you know, I'm, yeah, thank you for sharing. It was a really, really uh, touching piece. 
Shout out as well to Sherry's son. Um, inhibitors suck. I think that was actually the title of one of our uh, blood feed pieces that we created. It was like breaking news, inhibitors suck. Um, and we know that, but hemophilia B with inhibitors is often um, even suckier um, because it's just that much more rare and complicated. Um, so uh, shout out to him as well for having to fight the good fight as a man living with uh, hemophilia B and inhibitors. Um, and thank you again, Sherry. That's a powerful story. And as Natalie uh, spoke to, uh, an unsettling one in many ways, but a truthful one, a, a, a common one. And, and you know, like you mentioned, every day women are not being taken seriously and losing their lives uh, as a result of it. So it's unfortunately common. Um, so it's important that people share these kinds of stories. And if you've got a story like this that you would like to share with us, please do. Or if you would in general like to share your story of being a person with a bleeding disorder or a member of this community, you can email us at mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com. Hit us up on facebook.com backslash bloodstreammedia or on twitter.com at bloodstreaminfo. All right, now uh, bringing home the like, share, comment segments for this month. Uh, with the con- hey, you like the way I enunciated that there? <laughs> you know what I didn't say? Section. So this uh, came out just a couple days ago. It'll be about uh, two weeks ago by the time this podcast comes out. Um, but as listeners to this most likely are already aware of, there has been an ongoing patent dispute between um, Shire and Genentech Roche as it re- relates to emicizumab and Hemlibra. I'm not going to go back to the beginning of the story, but I will cover some highlights. The The reason that we're talking about it right now is August 7th, the U.S. District, District of Court in Delaware ruled against Shire in its request for a preliminary injunction against Roche um, from creating, transporting, and marketing its recently approved drug Hemlibra in the U.S., which received FDA approval to treat people with hemophilia A and inhibitors in 2018. This ruling means there are no legal limitations on the ability of physicians to prescribe Hemlibra at this time. So you could say that this is a win for Access. Um, this is a statement, by the way, that comes from NHF, and I'm inclined to want to read the disclaimer that um, th- that came with it. NHF and HFA will not engage in the dialogue around patent ownership and will not be, quote, choosing a side, quote, relative to this suit. NHF and HFA will remain focused on patient access to care. And if if and when we feel that it is being jeopardized, we will take any and all action necessary to ensure patient access to their prescribed therapies is not interrupted or denied. We are hopeful that both sides will conduct themselves in a way that will not jeopardize the health of the patients in the bleeding disorders community. Please note that NHF and HFA do not recommend, endorse, or make any representation about the efficacy, appropriateness, or suitability of any specific products, treatments, or opinions. Please consult your physician before use of any treatments. Um, Following that ruling, Shire did release a statement that said, quote, Shire is disappointed with yesterday's U.S. District Court ruling against the issuance of a preliminary injunction as part of the ongoing U.S. patent litigation against Roche subsidiaries, Genentech Inc. and Shugai Pharmaceuticals. Shire continues to believe that emicizumab infringes our patents and we look forward to move, and emicizumab and Hemlibra, one and the same essentially, we look forward to move uh, to more fully presenting our case as the underlying litigation moves forward as a company committed to serving the needs of our patients today and in the long term, protecting our IP intellectual property rights is critical to enabling us to reinvest in research and discovery of innovative new medicines that address critical patient need. Shire remains absolutely committed to continuing to push for what is right, preservation of our intellectual property to enable us to continue to fuel future innovation and life-saving therapies for our patients. We remain optimistic that this issue will ultimately be resolved fairly and equitably with no patient impact. Um, at the time of our recording, uh, I looked around, did not see uh, any public facing statement from Genentech Roche. I imagine uh, if there were to be one, it would have been like, woohoo, <laughs> great. Yes, we thought so too. Um, but I will also call back that in January, um, as this story was first kind of um, 
uh, coming up, coming about. Genentech published an open letter to the hemophilia community. I think it's called an open letter to the hemophilia community. We will, we have a link to that in the program notes. They lay out their case um, in really a short, um, uh, very articulate essay. So if you want to you know read that as well to recall uh, what Genentech's position is on this patent dispute, you can read that as well. Um, I do want to, uh, uh, just kind of going along the lines of HFA and NHF and not trying to play arbiter or referee in any way, I'm just trying to kind of present the information that's been made available. I did um, get a hold of the 29 page opinion and order from that US District Court in Delaware. And I'm just gonna read the, um, the final paragraph before the concluding paragraph and the concluding paragraph um, so that you can make your own decisions about what you think uh, this is saying. So here is the, uh, yeah, the second to last paragraph, the last paragraph before the conclusion. Uh, For non-inhibitor patients, those who would be barred from receiving him Libra under Baxalta's proposed injunction, as you'll recall, Shire acquired Baxalta, formerly Baxter, <laughs> and this lawsuit, uh, Baxalta is the entity being referenced. It's the same thing as Shire for all intents and purposes. One more time for non-inhibitor patients, those who would be barred from receiving Hemlibra under Baxalta's proposed injunction, Hemlibra uh, represents a potential sea change in the treatment of their hemophilia. The public interest favors availability of that treatment to the non-inhibitor population once approved by the FDA. The proposed carve-outs would not make that treatment available to the vast majority of non-inhibitor patients in need of Hemlibra treatment. In the face of this overwhelming evidence, Baxalta has not shown that an, an injunction would be in the public interest. Any irreparable injury to Baxalta from the sale of Hemlibra to the non inhibitor population is far outweighed by the public interest in making Hemlibra available to that population. Conclusion, Genentech has raised difficult questions concerning Baxalta's likelihood of success on the merits, including whether Hemlibra infringes Claim 1 of the 590 patent and whether Claim 1 is invalid for failure to satisfy the written description requirement. At the same time, Baxalta has failed to establish that it is at risk of significant irreparable harm or that the public interest f uh, weighs in favor of enjoining the sale of Hemlibra. Even assuming that Baxalta could show a likelihood of success on the merits in light of the absence of significant irreparable harm and Genentech's especially strong showing on the public interest, preliminary injunctive relief is not appropriate. Accordingly, Baxalta's motion for a preliminary injunction is denied. It is so ordered this 7th day of August, 2018. Signed, Honorable Timothy B. Uh, DYK. I don't know. <laughs> I feel like any way I may try to pronounce that would be wrong and offend somebody. So that's the last three letters of the man's last name. He is the U.S. Circuit Judge um, sitting by designation. So the bottom line is, uh, as it presently stands, there is nothing that is preventing um, physicians from prescribing hem libra in accordance with FDA approvals. There is no court uh, legal reason for a restriction on those prescriptions. That's my understanding, um, which in my eyes is a win for access. Um, and Shire will uh, continue to pursue their legal claims to patent infringement. And the story will continue to roll along in the background. But um, if you are struggling to get any kind of medication, I mean, one thing that was in Shire's statement is their commitment that this would not have um, uh, impact patient access. And I have heard people remark cynically about uh, uh, Shire's uh, stating that in, in conjunction with this entire patent dispute. Fine, if you want to uh, hold a cynical viewpoint of that statement, um, but if you take it at face value, and if you take what NHF and HFA say at face value, their interest in access for all patients, and I think Genentech would agree with the uh, the notion of access for all patients, then this is a this should be a win for access, and patients should continue to fight for the access that they deserve um, to receive the the treatments that they need. And if you're struggling with that contact your local NHF or HFA chapter or member organization, find the right advocates to help you pursue the line of action you need to get the medication you need. Don't let any of this, for our purposes as patients, let's call this noise. Don't let any of this noise stop you from pursuing what you need. Pursue it, pursue it, pursue it, and this will just continue to go on in the background. I think that's a fair enough assessment. So that's it. All right, that's the latest on this particularly um, uh, interesting story. And that will wrap up our like, share, comment segment for episode 27 of the Bloodstream Podcast. How about that?
Now for the episode 27 interview segment. This is a fun one. So Natalie and I participated in the uh, Save One Life Wheels for the World Barry Hardy Memorial Bike Ride in Rye, New Hampshire just last week. And Natalie collected eight interviews with Barry's family members who were present, participants in the ride, and organi- organizers from Save One Life. So this, uh, this interview segment's a mashup of these interviews that Natalie conducted during the ride to learn more about what inspired people to put this event together and attend this event, uh, memorializing Barry. And how do people the, who are present intend to keep Barry's life and legacy alive as, as they move forward? So let's give a listen to participants and organizers from the Wheels for the World Memorial Bike Ride honoring Barry Hart. I'm here in New Hampshire on a cloudy Sunday, uh, celebrating the life of Barry Hardy. Uh, We just finished up his memorial ride. I'm here with Patrick, his nephew. Uh, Patrick, tell me what today meant to you. Uh, It was a a great ride. Uh, It's great hearing everyone's stories about my Uncle Barry and learning some, some new things about him that he did and and just the impact that he had on the community. And I think it was a great idea to get everyone together and do the thing that Barry did best, and that was that's ride a bike. And you had shared with me earlier that you have your Uncle Barry's bike. After today's ride, um, do you feel inspired to continue riding? Uh, I, I will definitely like to kind of carry on his legacy, and when I get back, I'll try to hop on it and see, see how it is for the first time um but i would i would love to you know start getting on it and start start riding it because it can't just sit there and rest away so got to make use of it and maybe one day i'll i'll do one of the rides that he did and uh, if i can be half the rider and person that he is i'll be so grateful so that would be a really wonderful way to honor your uncle and to help carry on his legacy. And you're a member of uh, the hemophilia community. Yes, I, I am uh, part of the hemophilia community. I am part of an organization uh, at this at a kind of, not camp, but a, a retreat for young young adults and, and teenagers that it's called Bleed and it's FHA, Florida Hemophilia Association.org. Um, it's a great cause and Save One Life as well is a, a great cause. But I think that without him, the hemophilia community will definitely take a little bit of drop, but but definitely is bringing us together and I'm meeting so much wonderful people because this community is, is a great thing. Well, I'm looking forward to see how you carry on his legacy. Thanks for chatting with me. So I'm here with Priscilla, and uh, we're here um, honoring Barry. Priscilla, uh, what did today mean to you? It's so painful to remember all the nice things that Barry did for me and to be able to speak of them and realize he's not here to speak to anymore. So we have memories but I have something so special with Barry that people could never possibly understand because of my own son. And that's how Barry and I got to be so close. And uh, I'm tearing up because I knew I would. <laughs> but Barry was something to somebody, everybody. He, he was something to everyone. Everyone had a story about what he meant to them if they knew him mine just happened to be something that was indescribable because I don't even talk about my son and Barry allowed me to talk about things that I couldn't talk to my own son about and you have a spe- you had a special connection connection to him during his rides can you tell our audience a little bit about um, the slogan you came up with and Uh, the support you gave to him, both emotionally and financially, during his rides? Well, when I couldn't possibly go with him, and I became close friends with him through my emails, I hadn't even met him yet. 
But I told him that, and we were emailing and messaging each other, and I said, even though I can't be with you physically, I'm going to be with you spiritually. I will be with you every mile, Barry. That's exactly what I said. I will be with you every mile. And then I followed it up with that anagram, W-Y-E-M. The end of every day of his bike rides, you would see W-Y-E-M. I didn't even, my name was associated, but he knew exactly what I meant. And I didn't even have to say anything more. And I was telling the story about how that got him through a really difficult time when everybody was dropping out. And he thought of that phrase, with you every mile. And he told me that night that actually with every pedal push, he said, every mile, with you every mile. And that got him through that ride. I mean, that's a... You know, good for biking and good for life, too, with you every mile. It just, it's inspi- a very inspiring phrase. Um, and today at the bike ride, you won the raffle. So uh, do you plan on picking up cycling? I tried cycling two weeks ago. I had a bad fall in March, and I have hemophilia also. And I fractured seven ribs and uh, was in the hospital getting hemophilia concentrate. And... I was determined. The reason I wasn't on my bike was because I had fallen three years ago and got hurt, and I was afraid I would fall. But I got on the bike last weekend, and I tried to ride, and I lost lost faith in myself. I couldn't make one. I made a few pedals, and a guy came up and said, do you guys need help? And uh, my husband said, well, yeah. She can't ride. He said, well, let me help you. So they b- took both the handlebars, and I got going. And as I was going and they let me go, I felt like a little toddler. And then I said, Barry, you got to help me. Barry, you got to help me. Because I went one mile. Wow. And then when I had to come to a stop and turn around to try to start over, I couldn't get my leg up to go do it again. So I had to walk my bike back. I mean, but one mile is pretty impressive. And now that you have that new bike, who knows what's in your future? <laughs> Thanks for chatting with us today. Oh, thank you. I'm here at Barry's Memorial Ride with Debbie De La Riva. She came all the way to New Hampshire from Texas. And uh, t- what did today's ride mean to you, Debbie? You know, it's funny. I feel like I'm getting more from this event than giving to it. What I really wanted to do is just be a part of just um, commemorating Barry and see him for who he is and always will be. I mean, what he really did for us is give us inspiration and hope. And I just wanted to, I felt the need to come all the way here just to be a part of that in the energy. And, and you feel the hope here. There's 40 plus people with stories about how he inspired them. And it's amazing. Um, what do you plan to do to carry out Barry's legacy? One of the things I want to do is um, spread awareness about mental health in our community because we know if someone like Barry, a giant as he is and was, if he was having some type of issues, we want to make sure that everybody knows it's okay to talk about their issues and that they're not alone and to get help. Yeah, and it's, like you said, someone who was a figurehead in the community was struggling silently. How many others are struggling silently? So I think that would be a wonderful way to carry out Barry's legacy. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. I'm here with Steve Long at the Barry Memorial Ride. Steve, what did today mean to you? Well, I am a latecomer to the community. I was kind of Mr. Oblivious because I wasn't having a lot of difficulty uh, with bleeding. Uh, My annual bleed rate's less than one. Uh, Even though I'm a 4%, I've just... The luckiest guy in the room is what I call myself at the Blood Brotherhood uh, meetings because I just have all the good breaks, as opposed to guys like Barry who've had all the bad breaks and still done amazing things. Uh, I got to know Barry fairly well at NHF last year where the last night uh, with Mukesh from India and Morali, we we had the dinner that, that night and talked about a few things. And then a few weeks later, I got to go on the San Juan's expedition with Chris and and with him. And it's nothing like having Chris in the back of your boat the first day and the second day it's Cassie Starks, an all-American pole vaulter. And then on the fourth day, it's Barry. (laughs) Uh, And and with my military pension, I thought I was unusual. No, these guys are unusual. Uh, They're amazing. Uh, So Barry was a very unassuming guy. Uh, When he was in the back of my kayak, we suddenly started drifting off to the right 
It turns out he couldn't feel the pedals because he had peripheral neuropathy in both feet and had, and was so unassuming he never mentioned it until I said, Barry, what's going on? Uh, and we got it taken care of. But uh, he was just so matter of fact about his situation and yet he was doing amazing things. And uh, it's difficult to be... It takes a strong ego in some ways to do things, but it also takes a lot of humility, which he had in order to to do the things he does and to inspire people. And when somebody boasts about what they do, that's okay. But when they start to quiet about it, unassuming, they'll talk about it if you persuade them. Uh, that was Barry. And uh, I, I felt it was important to be here to, to acknowledge and support them. And that's what a lot of people are saying. He's like, uh, you know, the saying, silent rivers run deep. That sounds like... Barry, definitely. Um, do you have any plans to honor his legacy um, moving forward? Well, I, I walked over here to ask Chris Bombardier if Chris Seistrup, who you may have heard of as a bicyclist as well, does a lot of mountain biking out in Arizona. Uh, he, there's been talk of him doing a cross-country trip or some significant trip, and uh, I'd like to see that happen hopefully next summer. Uh, Chris has been recovering from something, so uh, let, let's hope that something like that happens. And If it's workable, uh, I may try to join some of that, but uh, my cycling days of any great distance are diminishing. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Okay, good. Have fun. Awesome. Thank you. I'm here with Martha Hopewell. And uh, Martha, what did today uh, Barry's Memorial Bike Ride mean to you? Well, it meant a lot to me because actually, as the executive director of Save One Life, I was the person in the background supporting all those rides. I raised the money for the rides. I, um, gosh, I followed Barry on all the rides. I helped set up interviews with him along the way, helped set up television interviews. Um, kind of was a champion of him, tracking, did all the Facebook posts of his rides on the Wheels for the World with Barry Hardy Facebook um, page that we have with Save One Life. Uh, sent all the thank yous to all the donors who gave to Barry, kept Barry informed of who was giving, you know, and how progress was being made with fundraising while he would ride across. Um, so... <clears throat> I was really kind of his his right hand person in terms of all the support to make those rides be a success while he was out there actually on the road doing the pedaling. I mean, yeah, you were doing the behind the scenes pedaling for I his <laughs> I was really doing the behind the scenes pedaling. <laughs> oh my gosh, but it was worth it and I enjoyed it and um, I really became so fond of Barry over the you know I didn't know Barry when he first started and by the end of the six years I knew him pretty well I'd imagine you know with yeah. all tracking the yeah. rides and, and being a part um, what do you plan to do to help carry his legacy forward well I think from my perspective I you know it's Barry's legacy but it's also the wheels for the world legacy and what that meant to save one life and that's probably what I'm most interested in is holding the wheels for the world concept alive, um, allowing it to have a future as a way of earning and raising funds for Save One Life, and hopefully finding other ways for the community to be able to participate, um, using Wheels for the World as a theme that also raises money for our mission. So that's more the perspective I have is the Wheels for the World legacy connected with Barry as the person who was the initial inspiration for Wheels for the World. It's really a challenge to raise money for Save One Life. And you know, Barry came along and provided a format that raised significant money for us that allowed us to exist as an organization and expand our programming to new countries, new program partners, new beneficiaries that we would not have been able to do. So the contribution of Wheels to the World just to save one life's survival and um, growth as an organization was absolutely critical. That's part of why it's so important for me to keep the Wheels for the World rides um, or some type of act event attached to Wheels for the World going forward. It does make a difference in what we're able to do. So, And I heard that uh, there's talk about next year maybe doing um, a cross-country ride, splitting it up state by state. Um, what, what do you have to say about that? Yes, yes, and yes. 
do it, guys. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, that's that's, that's enthusiasm <laughs> from Martha. Yes, um, yes, yes. And I, I think uh, to continue Wheels for the World, and uh, I, I think Barry would be uh, so jazzed to know that totally. that that Are people were coming totally out. <laughs> Great. You well, thank totally you so guess. much. Thanks. So I'm here with Emily, who's Barry's sister, and uh, she came all the way from Florida for today's ride in New Hampshire. And uh, Emily, what did today mean for you personally? What did it mean for your family? What it meant to us was that it's just wonderful that he had so many friends, and I mean real friends, people that would come here all the way from California and all the great people. It just it just helps us to get through all this and it's just the most wonderful thing and you were talking about earlier just processing you know and how processing death and processing loss there's been loss in this community there's been you've had personal loss um so being able to gather as a community and to honor your brother um is amazing do you have any plans in uh carrying out his legacy moving forward I do. I would. I, I haven't really figured out how, what I want to do yet, but I really want to do something because I know he would want me to. And um, there's a lot. There's people that are kind of counting on me because they they kind of look at me as like the next thing to Barry, because I really am the only relative that's that close that he that he has. And I just um, I'd really like to do something. Um, for Barry. So I don't know what that is yet, but I'll, I'm sure I'll find out. Well, and including the community in would be wonderful too, because That's what I mean. there are so many people who um, he touched in this community. And, yeah. and now you're... That's all he ever did was the community. <laughs> an adopted member of the community. And uh, it's been great to get to know you. So. Yeah, it's been great to get to know everybody. I mean, I've been to NHF and HFA, but I, and I know several people, but I wasn't as involved as I should be probably. But now I really feel like I should since I have a, son, a grandson with hemophilia and he's he's ready to go. My grandson is ready to go. So, <laughs> and we talked with Patrick earlier, and he his involvement, and he said that he has his uncle Barry's bike, and after today's ride, he feels inspired. So, uh, yeah, now I couldn't. I was really shocked at how how well he was able to ride. I was sure he would be in the back with me, <laughs> but he went right past me, and I didn't even see him. And um, I think he's gonna. I really think he's gonna do the riding. I really do. It, and um, We'll see how it goes, and then if he gets good enough, he's going to get his brother, his, his uncle's bike. So we'll see. Awesome. Well, thanks for chatting with me. So I'm here with the one and only Chris Bombardier, who is a Save One Life board member and uh, was also a bike rider in today's uh, memorial bike ride for Barry Hardy. Chris, what did today mean to you? Um, I think it was just fun to remember Barry, f- just to have an experience on a bike, too. Um, I'm not a big bike rider but um it was fun to like just pedal for a while even though it was only seven miles compared to like barry's hundred miles a day um and just I, I try to put myself in his shoes a little bit and think about what he would think about while he rode across the country and um how kind of peaceful it was um just listening to the sound of the the tires on the road and um just imagined what he saw as he pedaled all all over the country um it's just a cool way to like connect with him one final time well not one final time i'm sure there'll be other moments of connection but um yeah it was real special it was really really cool to have that experience and what did today's ride mean for save one life um you know barry was such a a great ambassador for save one life and you know six rides raising over two hundred fifty thousand dollars um just brought a lot of awareness to save one life um and in which leads to helping a lot of individuals uh, around the world that you know still struggle with hemophilia and you know despite all the things barry went through in his life he was able to overcome and and do these amazing feats and i feel like um it just provided a lot of hope for people and um a lot of people hope for uh, those kids um, that Save One Life uh, tries to help. Yeah, and you said it was just just seven miles today, but did it put into perspective uh, just how long his rides actually were? Oh my gosh, I don't even know. I don't even know how he would ride a hundred miles a day for like days. I, I mean, thousands of miles. I, I don't even remember what the total was, but like twenty thousand miles for it. Like, just amazing feat. Um, you know, I've 
climb some mountains, but uh, that seems like a very intimidating task. So uh, just even more respect for what he did. It's just very special. Well, and I liked how at the beginning, too, uh, they they put you in charge of leading the, the ride, even though, uh, like you said at the beginning of this interview, you are not a, a seasoned bike rider, but it's just the, oh, Chris Bombardier, he's the outdoorsman. He can do this. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that you were up for the challenge and you... Uh, took the lead <laughs> uh, except we got lost <laughs> but I, I, won't, I don't want to take, take take blame for that it's just the confusing street signage in uh, the New Hampshire area so I'll, I'll blame it on New Hampshire's street signs <laughs> well I'm sure Barry would have been proud so <laughs> thank you so much Thank you to our participants for contributing to that great segment. Thank you to Barry for all that he did, raising over a quarter million dollars for Save One Life across those six rides. And it was um, it was truly an honor to be a part of that very special moment. Uh, and personally, I, I got to stand with Barry's uh, nephew, Patrick, who you heard from in that interview segment, just after we dipped our bikes in the water like Barry used to. Uh, we hoisted our bikes over our head the way he would as well. And the two Patricks, uh, we got to stand side by side doing that. And that felt cool. That felt important. That that. I don't know. It just felt like something. So I'm, I'm, gl- I'm glad I was there and I'm, I'm glad I got to participate in that with uh, members of, of Barry's family and some incredible community as well. All right. Now moving on to parting shots. One last thing to share with you before we go and move on with the rest of our day and the end of our month. Parting shots. Moving into that part of the podcast now where we get to parting shots and say goodbye. But before we do that, one more time, I want to say thank you to Shire for making the Bloodstream podcast possible. We are 27 episodes in. We have had incredible guests who have been able to come on this podcast and share with you all. Um, and that has been enabled by Shire's support. So thank you, Shire, for continuing to give us the opportunity to create this podcast and to educate and engage our community in new forward thinking ways. All right, here we go. Parting shots for episode 27, August 2018, Bloodstream Podcast. You want to start it off? Yeah, start it off. You got to give us a parting shot. I'd like something to go away with. So I want to part with, a sh- yeah, what's your okay. parting shot for the month? So uh, I'm sure everyone has been wondering this whole month how the flywheel competition went. And oh, right. Yeah. We talked about it last month and we, um, this weekend we'll be riding bikes in honor of Barry. Mm -hmm. And um, I just want to say, although Patrick did not win the flywheel competition, in my eyes he did. I have never seen someone work harder in three weeks. Um, I mean, you went to so many (laughs) flywheel classes. Um, You know, and without throwing flywheel under the bus, not all the bikes are created equal in all the studios. There's new bikes and old bikes and there's a different point system. We happen to go to the old studios. So I, I would, you know, (laughs) I'd beg to say, is that, is that the saying? No, no comment. Yeah, I'd beg to say, yeah, no, (laughs) no, no comment. Also, Um, it was a little. You also like were in the top 3% finishers in the United States for men. But it's also annoying because there's like, I wanted to be able to kind of like share they did a really poor job of also like they never shared numbers rankings were shared only twice before the final it's just names and there's no and like you said i mean i go to classes here and i have a 20 25 percent higher score than i do on average in our studio with a different bike and it's just like that's significant but i mean you had fun right and i'm proud of you and you committed to it and you uh you came out stronger on the other side so well thanks an amazing month of dedication um to something that supports you physically and mentally and makes your wife very, very proud. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. What's your parting shot? My parting shot is extraordinarily simple. (laughs) Make sure you're registered to vote and make sure you vote. Our healthcare as people affected by bleeding disorders is one of the most important things. And while we're talking about creating a military base in space for billions of dollars, we continue to hear arguments against how it's too expensive to make healthcare a right for all people. But there are 
politicians out there and policymakers out there who are interested in not taking away the protections for people against with pre-existing conditions, the protections against lifetime caps and discriminations. There are people who are interested in actually going further to make healthcare a right for all of us. We can do this. This isn't a crazy idea. And every time I hear someone in our community speak against this, not only do I hear someone speaking against their own interest, but I, I hear a threat to my own health and safety. So register to vote, know who your candidates are, and vote for your own self-interest. If you have a chronic condition, you need to vote for politicians who will vote for legislation that protects you. That's my parting shot. It's an excellent parting shot. And that is all for this episode of the Bloodstream Podcast. Special thanks to everyone at Believe Limited, the National Hemophilia Foundation, Entertainment to Effect Change, the Hemophilia Alliance, and of course our sponsor, Shire. Thanks as well to Sherry Lucky for sharing her story of living in the shadows with mild hemophilia, and to all participants from our Wheels for the World interview segment. Subscribe to the Bloodstream Podcast, the Ask the Expert Podcast, the Powering Through Podcast, and the Bloodline special series of podcasts on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts, we are there. You can email us at mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com. You'll also find Bloodstream on facebook.com backslash bloodstreammedia and on Twitter at bloodstreaminfo. Reminder to check out the program notes for this episode in your podcast player or on bloodstreampod.com for links and additional information about the various stories featured on this episode. My name is Patrick James Lynch. And I'm Natalie Lynch. And until next time, take self-care of yourself. <laughs>